Romans chapter 8. We want to pick up in verse 26 where we left off last week. Paul is, has been talking concerning the, in the previous verses, how the Spirit uh, is working inside us, gives us that spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father, uh, Papa, our Daddy, that intimate uh, relationship with God, and um, and how we are led by the Spirit. Matter of fact, as I said last week, um, between chapters 1 and 7, the Holy Spirit is only mentioned one time in, in Romans, but then in chapter 8, he's mentioned at least 20 times in the verse, in, in these verses of chapter 8. So he is the focus, the Holy Spirit. He's God. He is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, with the Son. He is as much God as God the Father is. And um, we often forget that. We often ignore that the Spirit is God uh, because he's not there to draw attention to himself. He's to point us to Jesus Christ. He's come to teach us about uh, the ways of the cross, the ways of uh, walking with him. And so it's not his desire that you would be drawn to him, but be drawn to Jesus Christ. And as he is pointing these things out, as Paul is bringing us in there, he talks about how the creation was made subject to vanity. Um, and uh, through our sins, through our, uh, our sins, not willingly, it says in verse 20, but by reason of him who has subject the same in hope. And, and then he goes on and he talks about how the earth is groaning for the manifestations of the sons of God. That, that is the, the glorification of all of us and the glorification of Christ. That is, um, we begin in grace, but we all end up in glory. That is that you and I will one day be glorified. You are not going to stay in the same situation that you are right now. Amen? Aren't you glad of that? Yeah. I mean, to realize that uh, this is just, we're just passing through. It's like a bad dream that's going to turn into a good one. All right? And, uh, and so we're going, to, we're going to wake up in his presence, and we're going to be satisfied, as the psalmist says. When I awake in his likeness, I'll be satisfied. And uh, that's our glorification. We're now experiencing sanctification. We've been justified by the grace of God through our faith in him. But now the spirit is sanctifying us, setting us apart, making us like the image of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. And as we are going through all this, as we're, we're, we're being sanctified, the ultimate goal, as we're going to find out next week, in our, in our study, is the glorification of the saints as we persevere, as we continue on in, in walking and living for Jesus Christ. And so we see this, but now he tells us of something about the Spirit in verse 27 that is so, well, it's so comforting. Because he says, likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses for we know that not how, for for we know not what to how we should pray that is uh, as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, and He that is God that searches the heart knoweth what the mind of the Spirit is, because He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Father, I ask that you would just speak to us, that you would just minister to our hearts. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the churches today. Lord, we thank you so much for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, through our lives, for our lives. We thank you that you sent him, that he's the other comforter, another comforter, just like Jesus. There's no difference between him and Jesus. He has come to work his work, the continual work that Jesus begun. 
to do and to teach. And so we thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we ask, God, that you would bless now. In Jesus' name, amen. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, our weaknesses. Have you ever been in a place where it is such a traumatic, traumatizing event in your life that you just don't know how to pray, just don't know how to get it out and talk to them? I don't know how people can get through difficult times without God. The times that I have had and called upon my own father and, and, and I've found that the Holy Spirit is right there praying for me, speaking to God the Father. I remember as a, a young, young boy, uh, a tragic thing happened in our family's life. And, um, and I remember um, the, the fear, the, um, the, just the total terror of, of this event. And um, the panic of my family and just didn't know what. And we weren't church-going people. We, um, we... I probably went to church maybe four or five times up to that time, and I was in junior high at that time. And, uh, and I remember, but I remembered enough that God was, would be there. He would be my helper. And I remember crying out to him for my mother's sake and asking God to, 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 to just help us. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't, I, I, just, I just groaned, I just cry, uh, cried, I just couldn't say anything else in my life. And uh, I wasn't a Christian, I, I, and, but as I grew older, somebody introduced me to Jesus. Somebody told me about him, and I remember starting to go to church in ninth grade, and, uh, and going to this church, and... and uh, I dropped out. I quit. I after a few months, I, I just fell away, and and it wasn't for another four more years in my senior year in high school that that somebody uh, came up to me and and reintroduced me to Jesus Christ, and uh, and and it was from that point on that I've been walking with the Lord, and uh, and so. I remembered, uh, I, I thought, gosh, I, I, I lost four years. But I remember being introduced to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I didn't know who he was, didn't know what he was. I, matter of fact, I'd been brought to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, many times that, over and, and to the concerts on Saturday night. And, and I came to the Lord by myself all, um, in uh, on a Friday night in November of 1973, I, I accepted Jesus Christ. And, and when I asked the Lord to come into my life, I remember the preacher that I heard out at Costa Mesa saying I needed to make a public confession of that. Because if you didn't make a public confession, Jesus said he called everybody publicly. And, and he says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. If you do confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven, and so I wanted to make sure that that God knew my name, that that He had me down, you know, in a sense. And so I remember my brother bringing me to this Pentecostal church, and and I watched the show during that that morning, and uh, and then and then I came back that night, and um, and I remember those words of going forward and the invitation was there to come forward and I went forward and as I came down the altar workers were there and they said just get down on your knees and and uh, lift your hands and start praising God and start saying hallelujah and I'm just went okay 
And they told me I got it. I didn't know what I got, but I, I had gotten it, you know. And, uh, and the next night out at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, Pastor Chuck started teaching on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit on Monday evenings. And I found out who I had received, what I had gotten. And the Holy Spirit has been a continuous help ever since, all my life. And I recognize that he is always there whenever I find myself in such a weakened state. I cannot speak the right words. I can't even speak the words that I need to say to God for help. And so I just say, Lord... You know, there's, he says that, that, that there's groanings. Have you ever gotten to that point where you just groan? Maybe because of the pain, the sorrow, and you just groan. You can't say anything. There isn't anything that can be said. And it's at that moment that the Holy Spirit is inside of you through those groans interceding for you to the Father for you. And he that searches the, the heart, that is God. Remember Jeremiah said, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, but then the next verse is that God knows your heart. He tries and r- runs the reins of your heart. He knows what's in your heart. He's the one that searches our hearts, and as he is searching our heart, and the Greek word there is continuously. He is searching us continuously, our hearts, that is. That he is, as he's doing that, he, the Spirit, knowing the, the mind of the Spirit, God knows what the Spirit is saying through those groans, through those utterances that we cannot speak, that he understands our need. And there is nobody that can comfort you like God. When he wraps his loving arms around you and says, it is well with your soul. There's something just so powerful that the Spirit of God confirms to you. It's going to be okay. He'll take care of it. He's got it all under control. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know that you know that you know that you know. He's going to take it. And he's going to work it out for the good. And that's what the next verse is all about. And we know all things work together for the good, for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. He works it all together for good. Now, all things. Now, have you ever done a study in your Bible of just different phrases in in the Bible, like one another? You ever just looked up in your concordance the word one another and just, you know, love one another? Um, pray for one another. Um, don't murmur against one another. Uh, those are positive and negative ones, you know. Um, you know, uh, forgive one another. You know, and so there's, 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 there's those phrases that you can get a hold of your concordance and look up. There's another one called all things. Look up. That word, all things. I, I, uh, I did just a couple of days ago, I just got my concordance to begin to go down and look at all the, the things that we, there are. There's all things that, that it says here in, in, in um, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things. But there's, there's things that we come in contact with. There's things that we are, 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 are um, involved with. And the Bible talks about things. And um, like Genesis 9.3, it says there's terrible things. 
Um, there's hard things, there's holy things, there's good things, there's evil things, there's great things, there's wondrous things, there's marvelous things, there's glorious things, excellent things, right things, fat things, smooth things, liberal things, precious things, new things, crooked things, delectable things, hidden things, pleasant things, abominable things, Common things, mighty things, detestable things, secret things, unclean things, heavenly things, earthly things. And the list can go on and on and on. But the Bible says that all things works together for good. That God works them together for good. Not you. You don't have to worry about it. But God works all things together for the good. First, or excuse me, in Second Peter, it says this, that God has given us all things that pertain unto this life and godliness. Notice in, in, in Second Peter chapters 1, verse 3, it says, According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to his glory and virtue. That is, that God's given us everything that we need to live a spiritual life, to live a godly life. He's given us the word of God. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us prayer. He's given us the body of Christ. He's given us the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. He's given us all things. He's given us the ability to witness and share our faith. He's given us all things that we need to live this godly life. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Do all things without murmuring and, and disputings. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, it also says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it says all things twice in that verse. You might want to look it up later on. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Giving thanks Always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks always for all things. That is, are you thankful? Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 19 verse 26, one of my favorite stories. It's the story of, of uh, a rich man, a rich young ruler coming to Jesus Christ. And he says, Master, what, what do I lack? There's something lacking in my life I, to inherit eternal life. I've been watching you, observing you. I've been watching the people around you. And there's something lacking in my life. And he says, have you obeyed the commandments? He says, I've obeyed them from my youth. He says, he says uh, okay. He says, well, then go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And he walked away. Because he realized the thing that he could not keep, could not give up, was his riches. He was a covetous person. And so he walked away, and he was saddened. And you can imagine, as he walks away, Jesus said this. He says, I'm, I tell you the truth, it is easier for, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples said, then who can be saved, Lord? Because they thought if the rich can't get in, nobody can get in. Because they thought the rich were highly favored by God. And isn't it something how we always look at, at the outward? You know, if you got a lot of stuff, you must be blessed by God. Not necessarily. But here... They said, then who can be saved? And he says, with man, it's impossible. But here, with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. With God, all things are possible. And so, all things. Now, as we read here in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we see that uh, this beautiful promise... And it's just not a promise. It's a fact of, of, of life, basically. It's a fact. It's just not a promise. But because but that's what, what we know, it, it, as Paul says here. And we know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord or love God. What's your favorite Bible verse? 
maybe some of you said, well, Romans 8.28, I like that one so far. But what, what, what is your favorite verse? Some might say John 3.16, might say, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in me should not perish but have everlasting life. That, that's a beautiful one. How about Jeremiah 33, verse 3? That says, call upon me and I will answer thee and show you great and mighty things that you know not. There are some fantastic promises. Frankly, my favorite is Judges 16, verse 22. Now, I, matter of fact, I just want to read that to you so you know what my, your pastor's favorite Bible verse is. And uh, it, it says, Judges chapter 16, verse 22. You know what I'm talking about here? And it says, How be it the hair on his head began to grow again after he was shaved, all right? So that's a promise I'm claiming, all right? Not really. And we know. That all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. J.B. Phillips, in his translation of the Bible, his New Testament translation, says, Moreover, we know that to those who love God, who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into the pattern for good. The Amplified Bible says, we are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for God to those who love God and are called according to his design and his purpose. These verse, or this verse, I should say, no matter how you, 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 you read it, is a great promise. But as I said, it's just not a promise. It's a statement of fact. Because that's what Paul was wanting to make sure that we understand. And we know. I know this. I've walked with the Lord Jesus Christ long enough in my life that I know that he takes everything that happens in my life and works it together for good. No matter if it's good or if it's bad, he works all things together for the good. That's my security. This is my security to know that the, that the very providence of God is on my side. That he's working things together for good as long as I'm loving him. And I've been called according to his purpose, which I have, which you have. And so this little verse is, is one of, as I said, my favorite. And the reason why is because it's without limit. There's no limit to it. There's no boundaries to this verse. Today, it's our desire just to kind of pick this one up. You know, we've been kind of going through a chapter, but I, I just got to stop and camp out on this verse today. Not, not get going any farther. We'll do, we'll do the rest of chapter uh, uh, of Romans to next week. And then, and then when we get into chapter 9, we're going to do a study on Israel. How God, Israel fits into the plan of God. And here right in the middle of Romans, as he's talking to these people in Rome, he takes three chapters of the scriptures and he writes about Israel. And we're going to take a couple of weeks and just see how... Israel fits into the plan of God and how God wants us not to be ignorant of these things. He says that right in the scriptures in Romans, that he doesn't want us to be ignorant about Israel. And so he goes on and he, he lays out here. And, and so it's, it's, it's without boundaries, it's without limit. And here's the certainty of the promise. I know that all things, or we know that all things are, Work together. Now, there's, thing, there's certain things I can't know about. There's certain things I can't know about. For instance, the bee. Ron, you might like this back there. 
It's an, it is just an aerodynamic uh, mystery. Um, everything that we know about flying doesn't apply to the bee. You know that? It, it's not supposed to fly. But nobody told the bee that. <laughs> and you see him all over the place, just flying from flower to flower and going all over there. But there are some things that we can't know about. So there's things that we don't know about, and there's things that we can't know about. For instance, uh, uh, we don't know about, but there's things that we can't know about because God has reserved that for himself. For instance, like the rapture. No man knows the day nor the hour. It's just something that we can't know about. We can't know about who's going to go to heaven, in a sense. You know, there's, uh, I mean... I know that if I confess my sins, I'm saved and all that. But you know, the scriptures teach in Matthew chapter 13 that there are people that are in our midst that look like they might be just like us and act like us and fellowship with us just like uh, other people around us. And Jesus taught about the tares and the wheat. And you remember how the enemy planted tares in the wheat and, 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 and the man came to him and says, shall we tear them up? And he says, no, 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 no. Because if you try to start ripping out the tares, you might rip out some of the wheat. Just let them go until harvest time. And when we get to heaven, there are going to be things that we are totally shocked at. We're going to be shocked that some people are there and we thought would never make it. <laughs> then there's people that we thought were going to be certainly there and they're not there. And then the third one is the big shocker is that you're there. You know, <laughs> that, that, you are, that you made it in. You know, and, and, and so, you know, we're just going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to see these things happen. Now, as we go on, he says, there should be things that we should know about. And, and that's, I already alluded to it earlier, there's things that we should know about, that is, in the scriptures, there's about six different places. The scripture says, I don't want you to be ignorant of these brethren. Remember I told you that the largest denomination in Christianity is the ignorant brethren? <laughs> you know, Christians that don't know what they're supposed to know. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're, supposed to, we're not supposed to be ignorant of spiritual things. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that we shouldn't be ignorant of Old Testament theology. The things that, uh, that happen in the Old Testament are, is for us. That's why we study the Old Testament on Wednesday nights. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're not to be ignorant of the rapture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And in Romans chapter 11, we're not to be ignorant about the relationship of, to, uh, with God and Israel and how it relates to the, our Bible. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, we're not to be ignorant of eternity. And here, we're the, so there's things that we should know about. And it, these are the areas that we should know about, but we are most ignorant about usually spiritual warfare, Satan's devices. Old Testament theology, uh, you know, the rapture. And there's things that, that, we, that we find ourselves ignorant about that the scriptures tells us that we should know in our Christian life. But then there's things, as I said, there's things that we don't know. There's things that we sh can't know. There's things that we should know. But Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says there are things that we know, that we know. And the thing that we know is that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That is, if you love God, which I know that you do, or you wouldn't be here. God has promised you that everything and anything and all things that involve your life will work together for the good. It doesn't say you will know this in time, but he says you know this now. 
If you walked with the Lord for any length of time, you know this. You, you discovered it. You've watched him do this. And so, you know, remember in, the, in, the, in, in um, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How do you see God? Well, you see God in all, how he works all things together for the good. When I watch God work things out in your lives, in my life, I see God working all these things together for good. And so he doesn't say that you'll in time know this. No, you know this right now. You already know this. You might need to to be reminded of it every once in a while. But the fact is, he works all things together for good. And we know this. By the work of the Holy Spirit. How? By the work of the Holy Spirit in you, doing things through you, reminding you, telling you, in the middle of a bad day. How many's ever had a bad day? And how many's ever been reminded by the Holy Spirit, hey, I'm in charge. Follow me. Don't do it on your own. Don't go out there and try it on your own energies of your own flesh, but trust me. Trust in the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And so, he's going to work it out. How does he do this? Well, by the promise of the word of God. He has given us his word that he will work all things together, and he honors his word above his name. How? By the price that he paid for you. Notice as it goes on, let me just continue read. We'll get in depth in this next week, but he goes on. He says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be, the, uh, to be conformed into the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall I say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That is, the price that he gave of giving his own son is the assurance that he will hold nothing back that is good for you. He will work all things together for the good in your life because he's given us the most valuable thing in heaven, and that's his son, Jesus Christ. He gives us that peace that passes all understanding. You know, when you're in that trial, when you're in that situation where you're, you're hurting and God speaks to you, I'm here. I'm on your side. I'm working for you. There's a peace that you just know. I know this ain't over, but I know God is with me. I know God is right there in the center of it all, and he's taking care of it, and he'll, 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 he'll be with me. So this is that certainty. This is that the, the certainty of our thing. I, I, it is just, it's just there. It, I know that he's going to do it. But the extent of this whole promise is that he works all things together for the good. And the phrase all things, is, is, it, it, it just comprehends and, and, and takes care of everything in your life. All things. What does all mean? Everything. All things. All means all in the Greek. Not some things, part of the things. Not for a short time or, you know, you got to wait. No, it's all things. There's no qualification or limits to this promise. Neither this verse nor its contents allows for a restriction or condition. It just says he's working all things together for the good. For those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That is, for those that love him and those who are loved by him. That is that God says, if you love me, (laughs) be sure to one thing, I love you. And so 
as it says in 1 John, it, this hearing is love, not that we love him, but that he loved us first. And so he says, and, and so Paul writes here that, that he's, and this is why he, he goes on to say in Romans that what shall separate us from the love of God then? I mean, if, if he's, I mean, if he's given us his son, if he's promised us he's going to work all things together for the good, then, then what is going to ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? He says, shall tri- tribulation or distress or anything? And he goes down to all these things that happen to us, all these things that are around us and, 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 and come against us and that we in, in, in experience in our lives. And he says, no. <laughs> Nothing can separate you from the love of God. No matter what our situation, our suffering, our persecution, our sinful failures, God says he'll work it all together for the good. That is, the term work together means this, that God will basically take what is harmful to you and work together the various elements that will produce an And an effect greater than and completely different from the combination of otherwise harmful agents. That means he'll turn the bitter to sweet. Just like you remember when the children of Israel came to the water and they started to drink it there at Myra. And as they begin to drink, they go, oh, my goodness, this this is bad water. This is... This is no good. It's, it's bitter. And the Lord says, put the tree in it. Put the tree in it, Moses. Put the cross there. And all of a sudden, the water became sweet. You remember the prophets in the school of prophets with Elisha as they were, they were sitting there and they were making some stew. And as they were putting their ingredients in there, they, one guy reached in there and they go, oh, it's poison in the pot. And they s- turned to Elisha and says, there's poison in the pot, master. And, and he says, put some meal in it. And the meal is the word of God. And he says, put the meal in it. And all of a sudden, as they put the meal in it, they tasted it. And the bitterness was gone the cross the word and he says he'll take what is bitter he'll take what is harmful to you and he'll make it sweet it all works together David testified of this truth in Psalms 25 verse 10 as he testified that all the ways of God are well they're just fantastic now it tells us that God works all things together for the good. All things. What things? Well, the, the quick answer is the good things and the bad things. I mean, the things that are good to, in your life, the things that are bad. God takes everything, no matter what it is, and makes sure that it works together for good. That means that, that God ha- has promised you to work all things for the good. How can you lose with that kind of promise? You can't. And who wouldn't want to live for that promise or for with that with that promise applied to their lives? It means that God's power works together for your good. It means his faithfulness and wisdom and his goodness works together for our good. But not only that, all of God's holy word works for our good. That's why Paul writes in, in 2 Timothy that, that, that the word of God is inspired. And he, and he goes on to say in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that it's inspired, it's given, and it's profitable to you. If for doctrine and for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And that is that he gives us the word of God for everything that we need, for for our reproof, for our correction, for our instruction, that that God will work all things, all his word out for the good. Your prayer life. Now, there are some things that you have prayed. I have prayed. Maybe you haven't, but I know I have. I'll confess 
that we're totally selfish. Don't look at me like that. You've never asked God for something that's totally selfish? You know, just, oh, God, I'd like to have that. You know, wouldn't that be nice, God? Huh? You know, and, he, and, and, and yet, I, I, there are some things that I'm glad God has not answered. This world would be an empty place if God answered all my prayers. You know, especially the freeways. God, get them out of my way, you know, and send them to the cornfield, you know, whatever, you know, and stuff. It's just, I'd, I, I'd be dangerous if I got everything I asked for. But he works all my prayers out for the good. And there's times where God's asked, answered my prayers that he answers them in a way that wasn't exactly how I asked. But it was the way it needed to be answered. And so he answered, he works all things out. Even the angels that God created are working for my good. The scripture says that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, that they are ministers to the heirs of salvation. That's you. That God created these angelic agents to, to work on your behalf. You're going to see some angels when you get to heaven that are going to be bruised up, battered up, <laughs> broken, and they're over there limping, you know, and, says, and they said, which one's my guardian angel? Well, that one right there, <laughs> you know. What happened to you? Well, you know, when you were going across the street the other day, you know, I had to save your life, you know, or whatever. God just intervenes in you for you. And lastly, it means also well, Romans chapter 1, verse 12, it talks about us, how he uses each one of us to minister good to one another. He even uses he, uh, uh, brothers and sisters to, to bring about his goodness in our lives. It's by our faith it, that enables us to encourage and edify one another, but also the scripture says bad things. He takes the good things and works them out for his plan, his, his will in our lives. But he also takes the bad things, the things that we've failed at, the things that have happened to us. Doesn't your Bible say all things work together? I know mine does. I think yours does. If you, your Bible doesn't say that, get a new Bible, <laughs> you know. Get a different one, you know. But it says here, that, that, that he works all things, that is, that he overrides anything and everything that is bad in your life by working it out some way, somehow, for the good. Have you ever been in that situation where something terrible happens, and then after a t period of time, you look back on it and say, you know what, something did come out of that good. Because you look at it and you say, there is nothing of any value. There's things in that in my life that I've done in my past that I go, there is nothing good in this whole thing. But God in time shows me, Roger, here's the good out of it. And I go, wow, you're right. You do work all things together for good. You remember the suffering of Naomi and Ruth? I mean, here's a woman that changed her name to bitter. How would you like to change your name today? What do you want to name, be named? Just call me bitter. And she comes back home to Bethlehem after the death of her husband and the death of her two sons. Her daughter-in-law leaves her. One of her daughter-in-laws leaves her. And now she's got this Moabite woman tagging along, and it's a confession to the whole city that she's allowed her son to marry a person that was cursed under the law that was not to be accepted in at all by the Israelites. And here she's coming back into the town, and she's got Ruth right next to her. Although she's a beautiful woman uh, uh, and, and just a, a, a used by God, here she is coming there, this Gentile widow, and it's a confession to the whole town that she's blown it. 
And here, because she allowed her sons to get married after the death of her, her husband, and they get married, they and then pinely and sickly died. And, and as they died, and now they, and they come back, and she's there, and they go, Oh, Naomi, Naomi, you're so, we're so glad that, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me bitter. Oh. And so she, she goes out there, and, and it's like that. But what, what happens? God takes that whole situation and brings joy to Naomi, doesn't he? The story is not just about Ruth. It's about Naomi, how she worked all things together for good. Because it says there that when, she, when Ruth gave birth to Boaz, Naomi, no, not Boaz, what was it Obed? Obed. That she became the nurse of that child, took care of him. Now, I, I identify that with that you know me and diane right now we're just rejoicing in the in the in the birth of our little uh, our, our little granddaughter and she just turned five, four months old this this last friday and 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 we're just looking at her we're we're, we're go we go crazy andrew gets so mad at me because <laughs> when when she comes in the room i could care less about anybody else and i just pay attention he's saying now dad i need to talk to you about something and I'm just so in, 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 in locked in to Lana that he says, Dad, Dad, I need to talk to you. And he walks out. He just stomps out, mad. <laughs> You're not listening to me. You won't talk to me. And I, and I look at him. What's he mad about? You know, because I don't care. <laughs> you know, really, I don't care. I just go, goodbye, you know. And, 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 and that's it. And here is Naomi. And she, you know, she's just full of just joy. Because God took a bad situation and he turned it out for his glory. He worked it all together for good. Job, you remember Job? I mean, here God did the same thing for Job's life. This means he'll take the temptations of our lives as well and work them together for good. Because just as suffering causes us to desire heaven, temptation often drives us to our knees. This verse also means that God will turn our sins into something good. Not that we should go out and do sin so good might come. But he takes our failures and he even works them together for good. As I cry out to him and I ask him to wash me, help me, cleanse me, I find that I begin to build up a hatred for those things that took me down. And I begin to hate sin like God wants me to hate sin. And so he works all things together for the good. And so it says that he works all things, not some things, but all things together for good. Remember, not, not all things are good in your life, but he works all things for the good. Now, who's the promise to? To them that love God. That's who the promise is made to, to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Many titles are given to us as Christians. There are believers, we're called believers, we're followers of the way, Christians, saints, brothers and sisters in Christ. And the list can go on and on and on, but here we are identified as those who love God. Isn't that a great title to have? Those who love God. Now, how can I love God? How can I know that I love God? Well, ask yourself these questions. Do you love his forgiveness he offers you? Do you have a desire to know him? Do you trust in his power to protect you? Do you love his peace that he gives? Do you love to do his will? Do you love the things that he loves? Do you love the people that he loves? Do you hate the things that he hates? That's all part of loving God. It's just not loving the things he loves, but it's also hating the things that he hates. 
Do you love the fact that he's coming soon? Do you love the fact that he's coming soon? Are you looking forward to him coming? But wait a minute, my retirement's coming. I've, I've worked hard for this. Hey. Who cares? <laughs> I mean, literally, I mean, if you get to retire, great. But if Jesus comes back on your first day of retirement, what a great present, huh? Yeah. Leave it here. Just go with him, you know, and let's go. Let's get out of here. But here, and lastly, are you obedient? Are you obedient? If you love me, Jesus said, you'll do my commandments. You'll be obedient. This is how you know you're called and how you're loved and how you love him is by being obedient. And if you fit that composite drawing of just answering those questions, yep, that's me, that's me, that's me. You're a person that loves the Lord. And then you know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Now, if you're one of those people, he's going to glorify you one of these days. I would be negligent to close right now. There's only one more story I want to tell you. It's found in the book of Genesis. You know the, you know the story. It's a story of Jacob. He's been a conniver. He's wrestled with God. God's changed him. He's known as Israel around the place, but he still has that, that, that temperament of, that can go back into a surplanner. He's got all these sons, you remember them? They're not, I mean, they're a rough neighborhood. You know, they've, they've done some bad things. And they have this one brother. He's a dreamer. And uh, you know what they did to him. They grabbed him, put him in a pit. Then eventually they sold him to some Midianites going down into, uh, into Egypt. And they sold him to the Egyptians. And he becomes uh, a slave down there. And Joseph was down there and says the Lord was with him. God prospered him and prospered fair, uh, Potiphar's house, and then he gets thrown in jail and because his wife wanted to sleep with him. Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with him, and he wouldn't do it. And, 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 and so she cried rape, and they throw him in prison. Two guys are there, and he interprets their dream for him, and it comes to pass. One gets freed, and one was killed, and, and years go by, and he's left there in prison. Then all of a sudden, Pharaoh has a dream. And you remember the dream. And as he has this dream, this guy sitting there that, was, that had his dream interpreted by him in prison, uh, and he says, hey, there's a guy in prison that I know that interpreted my dream. It came to pass, and he can tell you what this dream means, king. And, and, and so Pharaoh brings him out. He tells him the dream, and it comes to pass. And he's second in command. There's a famine in the land all around. Oh, they've been, they had seven years of bumper crops, and they've really, uh, Joseph really made them sure that they saved up and they kept all the grain so they could feed the people around there, uh, the Egyptian empire. And Jacob, back home, he thinks his son is dead. And, uh, and he sends his sons down to Egypt to get some grain. He said, why are we sitting there here? We're going to die if we do that. Get down to Egypt and get some grain. And so they went down there. And as they went down there, uh, Joseph spots his brothers. Calls them over and gives them a bad time. You remember the story? He kind of keeps himself hid he, you know, from them. And, and, and they don't know it's his brother. They haven't seen him in over 20 years. And, and, um, and as they see this guy, they, all of a sudden... They say to each other, when they're having this whole difficulty, and he says, you know, this is because of what we did to our younger brother when he begged us, cried, begged us to not do this to him. And they've been living with guilt for 20 years. 
Every day they get up and look at each other and re be reminded, man, we sold our brother into slavery. And he's probably good as dead now. But we've got to live with that guilt. And they lived with that for 20 years. And as they went down there and, and, and had this, they get come back and they and and Joseph keeps one of them and goes back there and and you know what Jacob said when he heard the whole story he says all things are against me all things are against me now you know the whole story was that true If you didn't know the story and you were standing there with Jacob that day, would you believe him when he said all things are against me? When you look at all the thing, all the situation of the story, everything that was happening, how it all unfolded and everything else, you would think, Jacob, you're right. You've lost your wife, Rachel. You've lost Joseph. Now you've lost another son down there. You're being tormented by this guy. You know what? Everything's against you. And you might think so. But you keep on reading the story, and you find out that wasn't the story. That was the end of the story. God was working all things together for good for them. You remember, even after the death of Jacob, his brothers thought, oh, now we're in for it. Now that dad's dead... Joseph's going to take it out on us. And so they come up with this scheme and they lay it out there for Joseph. And Joseph just weeps and he says, brothers, he says, you meant this for evil. But God turned it around for good. You know, there's things that, that we might think this is all things are against me. But Joseph said, no, all this happened so that God would save our family. That family was the nation of Israel. God allowed this to happen to me so that God could save all of us. And what you meant for evil, guys, Judah, Reuben, Simeon, Naphtali, all of you guys, Levi, Gad, all of you, every single one, all of you, that you meant for evil. You wanted to do away with me, but God was working it all together for good. Not all things are against you. If you ever get to that point where you think all things are against you, be reminded of the story of Jacob and Joseph. Because you don't know, today you don't know the full story yet. God is taking care of the problem in your life. If you, whatever it might be, you're thinking, well, how's this going to work tomorrow? How's this going to turn out tomorrow or the next day or the week after or the next year? What, what's going to happen? You don't know the story yet. But you know one thing. All things work together for the good, for them that love the Lord. I know that in my heart. I know that in my mind. I know that as a fact of life because I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And when you guys share something, how it works out good in your life, I just go, Romans 8, 28. Why should we be surprised of that? Because God is going to work it together for good. Amen? Amen. You believe that? You do? Are you sure? We know this, don't we? Amen. Father, we come before you. And we thank you. We thank you that this promise isn't predicated really on us. We just need to love you. And boy, you're easy to love. <laughs> But you take every situation in our lives, no matter if it's hard, no matter if it's bad, no matter if it's easy, no matter if it's good, and you just take it all and work it out. And Lord, there's only one person that could do that, and that's you. Nobody in this world could take everything that happens to 
a group of people that love you and work it together for good. There's no way that you can take an accident and turn it out for the good or a sickness and turn it out for the good. Or a financial problem and turn it out for the good. God, you can do all things. Nothing's impossible with you. So Lord, we want to commit our lives to you. And we just want to lay ourselves at your feet and say, Lord, you be master. You be the Lord of my life. I'll just follow you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, or maybe you have before and you've fallen away, you just aren't walking with him anymore. You're not following him. You're not living that Christian life anymore. It's time to come home. It's time to just return back to him and say, God, forgive me. If you're not a Christian and you want to be a Christian and you know that this is the only way that you, you, you want to live and you want to forsake your sins, you want to turn from your sins and you want to give your life to God, you need to admit that you're a sinner. You need to turn from your sins and you need to give God your life. How do you do that? By surrendering to him right now. You say, God, I confess I'm a sinner. I ask that you would forgive me. I believe that Jesus died for me and that you would come now into my life and make me one of yours. I accept you as my Savior. I confess you as my Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.